Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today, we're going to be talking with landscape photographer Chuck Haney about photographing in the national parks. The Understand Photography Show is, of course, a podcast, so if you're wondering why we don't have any visuals, that's why. But we do put the behind the scenes video on Facebook and on YouTube. We broadcast on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we also put the show notes right on our website. So we embed the video and put the show notes in the website along with photographs from our guests. So that's the best way to look at the, at the pictures that we talk about and also get the links to the guest's website and things like that. Now, while you're on our website, the first thing you're going to see when you go to understandphotography.com, it says click here for freebies. Go ahead and click there. We'll put you on our email list. We send out an email just once a month and it has photo tips in it and tells you all the different things happening with Understand Photography. We also have a couple of two free Facebook groups where you can you know, interact and share photos and get advice and things like that. One is called the Understand Photography Facebook group, duh, and that is a general group. So what kind of camera should I buy? What do you think of this lens? What do you, could you critique this picture? That kind of stuff goes on that page or that group, I guess they call it on Facebook. Um, we also do fun things in there like monochrome Mondays and whatever Wednesdays and you can share pictures. The other group is called Selling Your Photography as Art. Now if you are interested in selling your photography, that's the group to join. We, yes, we share pictures, we do that as well, but we talk about things like you know, how to succeed in an art fair or how, how you did or questions that you have about you know, maybe you, you want to get into an art fair, how do you get into a juried show, um, how do you sell your photography online, that's a big topic of course, uh, things like that. So selling your photography is art. You can reach both those groups right from our Facebook page, facebook.com slash understand photography. So Chuck Haney is my guest today. He lives in Montana, but he's here in Florida because it's warmer here. No, I don't know. He's here because he's leading a workshop. <laughs> anyway, Chuck has published, oh my goodness, he's published 16 coffee sta style table, I can't talk today, coffee mm -hmm. table style photo books packed with his incredible images from all his travels. He's been published all over the place, but I'm going to let Chuck talk to you and tell you about that. So welcome, Chuck. Thank you. Nice to be with you. And, and I am enjoying the warm weather. Yeah. It's much nicer than Montana this time of year. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to give you a you know, quick synopsis of my photography career. Um, I went on a bicycle tour in 1989. I rode my bike all the way across the country and I wanted to document the ride. So I got into photography, you know, I got a camera and at the end of the ride, I did my slideshow and kind of set the wheels in motion. Then I moved to Montana and uh, fell in love with Glacier National Park, which was next door. Started shooting on the weekends. I still had a regular job and uh, just started shooting more and more. And, and a couple years later, I got a book offer uh, to do a, a coffee table book on the state of Montana with another photographer. And so, 25 years, I'm still at it. <laughs> and I've been traveling all over the world, well, more, more of the world lately. And I've been leading photo tours the last 20 years. And uh, just trying to roll with all the changes in a crazy business. It sure is. <laughs> yeah. So, tell us, where are some of your photo tours? Um, mostly national parks, which are a good job. Um, you know, Glacier National Park where I live, I always do one there, but I have a real loyal following, so I have to I find new places for to take them. So I've been whittling uh, through the list of national parks and trying to get more, and I've been doing more international uh, tours as well. I did Ireland last year and Iceland the year before that, and we're going back there soon, and also the Czech Republic. Staying in those cold places, huh? Well, we go in the, the fall. It's, <laughs> it's very nice. But yeah, Ireland's actually better. Well, maybe Ireland's not the Floridians. But it's, it's pleasant. Let's put it that way. You, you're t pleasant, and the people are astoundingly friendly. 
I know. Very nice. And it's green They're on green. They're unbelievably and friendly, aren't unbelievable. they? Unbelievable, yeah. I, yeah. I just never I thought people were friendly everywhere. I've been, people have been pretty friendly, right? Yeah. But not until I went to Ireland did yeah. I really understand friendliness. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the national parks are a big draw, so that's why. How many national parks have you been to? Yeah, I know you asked me that, to look that up, and so I went through, and I think there's 62 national parks or monuments, and I've been to 33. Wow. So, you know, other than the really hard to get to ones, like in uh, Alaska or, you know, um, most of uh, the main ones I've, I've been to many times, actually. Wow. Yeah. And that it's, is... they're always, they never disappoint, you know, just every, they're so diverse and, you know, they were made parks for a reason because they're so beautiful. And, you know, you always find good photo opportunities almost every place you look. So how, how do you, like, how do you do the research? How do I do the research? Um, <clears throat> probably like most people nowadays, on the internet, mm -hmm. you know, I uh, used to buy guidebooks and and look at all the print publications I could find and books, and I still do some of that. But I do a lot of research on the internet uh, before I go so, to even look at other photographers who've been there. Yeah, I was not that say. I want to copy their work just to get an idea of where the to good go. places to go. Right. Yeah. So what, what like, what would you search under? Like say, okay, so you know, you're here, you're gonna go to Everglades National Park today, or not mm -hmm. today, but this on this tour, right? Right. So what would you what would you search under? Well, what would you search under like photo spots, Everglades National Park? Exactly, best photo locations. That's okay. always a good one. And you know, like for us, we're gonna be photographing birds mostly, uh, on this workshop. So I'm trying to find birding sites to find where the best places to go for the birds are this time of year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately that changes a lot in our area. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's... It's very but wet are, this year. It's oh, like, is it? Yeah, so they're they're not as easy to find this oh, year. Yeah. Just a little FYI. Yeah. Uh, I've had, I've, I've been there the last week here and there to, to scout and there's, I think we'll have plenty of birds. So you so. go early too. I do. Yeah, when I have time, uh, I always like to scout things out a little bit okay. ahead of time. And that's how I do it when I go to uh, like a more distant locations. Like if I go to Iceland or Ireland, mm -hmm. I try to go the year before, scout it out and get every, all the logistics lined up before I uh, assemble a workshop. Yeah, that's what I did too. And then once you do it, then you get even more excited because you got the good base and then you can find other cool things to add to the base of your workshop, right? Right. The second time is exciting. The logistics are, take uh, for us, like when we did Ireland, we stopped in, it was an 11 day tour and so we stopped in, I think six or seven locations. And so we spent a couple nights at each place and so there was a lot of lining up with hotels that and is a lot of meals work. and you know uh we had a driver which was great so yeah because they know. drive on the wrong side of the road they do it's, <laughs> it's a very, very trippy the first year you do it i'm never gonna do it <laughs> i'm never driving on the wrong i tried it in st croix yeah and in st croix they use cars like ours with the steering wheel on which side's our steering steering wheel on? The left. The left, but they drive on the other side of the road. Oh. And I was and so the lady who was from St. Croix, she actually went on our St. Croix tour because, you know, like you, I have loyal people and she likes to travel with us and she didn't travel, she just went to our workshop. And she kept saying, Ass to the grass, ass to the grass. So I remember <laughs> to keep like you know that yeah. part of my body to the grass but then when you get to a turn it's terrifying so i'm like roundabouts are very and roundabouts well. are hard enough when you know what you're doing i'm never doing it <laughs> did you go to northern ireland yes did you go to the dark hedges we did oh my god yeah. that was my favorite we did the dark hedges in the giant's causeway yeah yeah which was close by that was pretty too but yeah the dark hedges my photograph from there was just because I went, I didn't go on a photo tour. I just went, mm -hmm. I went on a Catholic tour with my aunt, the nun. Mm -hmm. And so he, he gave us like 
you got five minutes, get out of the car, get a shot and get back in or the bus. And uh, it's I did it with my little point and shoot and it's still one of my favorite yeah. pictures that I took from Ireland. It came out so cool. It's such a cool thing to see. It's beautiful. It's getting harder to photograph. Um, Cause there's so many cars and people. too many people know about it because yeah. you don't want anybody in the shot down the road. So you have to wait your turn or, you know, just get kind of aggressive with people and please move over. <laughs> I got and lucky. let us get a couple shots. I got so lucky because I literally had five minutes and there was one guy, just one guy walking in the middle of the street because there were a lot of cars going through. So people had to get out of the street. But this guy, one guy went into the middle of the street and I got like, it was perfect having him. He was just, I just photoshopped him. I just moved him a little bit over mm -hmm. so that I could have him centered, you know, but it came out really cool. God, that place was cool. Yeah. And so you're going there again? Yep. Oh man. Yeah. All right, but we're not talking yeah. about Ireland. We're talking about national parks. National so parks. how do you how do you find specific iconic locations? Okay, so well that's kind of the same thing. Same yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. You and just... how do you know what time of day to shoot them and all that kind of stuff? Well, you know, I mean, you look at maps. Do you use the apps, the little apps uh, that tell you where the light's going to be? Sometimes those are handy, but you don't always get internet service. Uh, or phone service in a lot of the places, so that's kind of an issue. So mostly, yeah, uh, I look at a map ahead of time and see which way their things are facing, and then determine if they're better for sunrise or sunset, or some things are better obviously on cloudy days. So it's always good to have a plan A, plan B, and plan C when you go to the workshops, uh, just to cover all the weather conditions that may pop up. Oh yeah. We mm -hmm. just, Joe, um, you know, the guy, Joe Fitzpatrick is our lead instructor here and he has four Everglades trips this year because we just kept selling them. So we just, I just gonna work the poor band to death. <laughs> okay, you wanna give us money, I'll make Joe work. <laughs> yeah. He loves it. Anyway, of course, you know, it rained a lot last mm -hmm. week, but he, he always comes that happens. through. He always <laughs> comes through and finds the cool thing. They were flying high when they got back yesterday. Yeah, yesterday, I guess. So, um, what about how do you come up with, okay, let's think of something like Mount Rushmore, okay? How do you come up with, obviously, you want to take that same shot everybody else takes just because you want that shot. Mm -hmm. But how do you come up with, like a better way to shoot that and how do you inst you know you're instructing people too right it's like okay i could have taken that with my cell phone kind of thing you know yeah so. no, that's a tough one i mean uh, a it, it's just you have to shoot according to the conditions of the day uh when you're there so a lot of times you're only at these locations or spots one time right so you have to you know take what you get as far as that goes but you know i mean you, Sometimes, like with Mount Rushmore, you could try maybe a night shot. Ooh, that would be you know, cool. Do they light up. it up at night? They do. And then, you know, they have a fireworks on the 4th of July. I've seen some photos of oh, that are a little cool. different. But, yeah, it's kind of hard to get something totally original Yeah. Uh, with something such a static, you know, monument. And a lot of, a lot of locations are like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, you know. Yeah. I mean, here. I mean, we... every day is slightly different with the light or the weather, so you can get something kind of unique. And then, I mean, as a nature landscape photographer, you just have to hope that you're there on that day when the clouds all turn red or uh, there's a lightning storm, something unique. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of places that I've shot over and over and, like, Glacier National Park where I live and uh, yeah I mean uh, it's kind of the holy grail of some of the spots to get there like our most iconic spot in Glacier is called Wild Goose Island it's a little tiny island this big lake surrounded by peaks but if you're there at 5 30 in the morning in the summer and the clouds are hanging up in the mountains and it's clear to the east you might get like 15 or 20 minutes of red clouds Ooh. over the lake and just very dramatic lighting. Ooh. So that, yeah, that, <laughs> those are kind of, those are the, I mean, I, I tell my students when we bag those kind of shots, you're very lucky because it doesn't happen that often. If it did, it'd be too easy, right? 
I, I do a joint photo trip to Tuscany, and I go with a local photographer, Stefano. And we were at this one spot that he goes to all the time, but the fog and the light and everything was so cool. And he mm. was so funny because, you know, he's Italian, so he's very expressive. And he's like, this is epic. And he was, <laughs> it was so funny, but he was so excited because we didn't even know any, di you know, this is good, this is bad. We don't know, right? We've never been there before to that That's spot. That's still the rush. I mean, oh. after all these years of taking photos, uh, to go to a, a cool place and end up with extraordinary lighting, it's, it's yeah, that's what keeps me doing it. I mean, there's always that hope that it's going to be the best one ever, you know. And, uh, you know, if it's always blue sky days and no clouds, it's not, it, yeah. then it's not so great. But uh, It's so funny because here, you know, n nobody comes here in the summer. And guess when the best time to take photographs for landscape photography is I the agree. summer. I, Clyde always, Butcher, if you look at his pictures, they're all taken in the summer. That's. I was just going to mention him because I'm going to take my class to visit his gallery on the way over to Big the other side. And uh, yeah, his shots are mostly those dramatic thunderheads and yeah, I would love to see that. I'm, I'm not so sure I would like the mosquitoes. <laughs> And I hear are really bad in the park at that time of year, but the storms would be awesome. I mean, to get lightning shots and and uh, big clouds like that, that's pretty pretty exciting. It's awesome. It's so beautiful. Just don't go all the way down to Flamingo in the summer because they've got those big biting flies as well as we have 250 species of mosquitoes in Florida. <laughs> but okay, you, I'll stay in Montana. We well, only have one, and they're yeah. they're just huge. <laughs> Ours are the worst ones are the little black ones. Those yeah. are the worst, meanest, nastiest ones. <clears throat> but you get about, you know, you get bug jackets and don't, you don't have to wear all that stuff in Montana. Oh no, I mean, well, not the jackets, but you definitely want to put spray on there. Well, they have, we have yeah. jackets and buffs. We only have them for about a month. They're, they're really bad. The rest of the season's not too bad. So um, how do you find like something unique to take your people to. Is that just from being boots on the ground? Is that the only way or? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's experience going to different places. Uh, um, again, it's, it's mostly the, the lighting conditions and the weather is the big variable. But, uh, you know, I like to take them to less iconic places as well. And, uh, you know, for example, we had uh, some big fires a couple years ago, but the remnants of the fires is in the summer, it's loaded with wildflowers now. So there's, you have these meadows full of wildflowers against burnt tree trunks. Ooh, that and that can be good. quite interesting. And then in the fall, all the ground cover turns like shades of red, orange, yellow. And it's quite stunning, and that, that wasn't there a few years ago. So little things like that, I think, are always kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, things that aren't maybe so obvious at first, but then uh, if you get in there and start looking around, you find all kinds of pictures and compositions. Okay, okay. So when you're planning a trip, how do, how do you go about planning? Do you, now, you have to get permits and things like that, too, exactly. right? Yeah, I mean, there's so a what, lot to what, it. I mean... All the national parks require permits, and they all have different policies. Oh my God! You think it would be uniform, but uh, it's not. There's different paperwork. There's different pay structures. There's, you know, different rules in each park. So yeah, that's what I do. Spend most of the winter doing is lining up, you know, the logistics and all the paperwork and the permits, and making sure I have everything. And uh, you know, you have to be. Uh, I have to know first aid and CPR, yeah. things like that. And in Glacier, you need to have bear training. Oh, bear training. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, which is good. You, you don't want to go with a guy that doesn't know what to do <laughs> if you encounter a bear. That's so, I, wow, that blows my mind. That's it's so interesting. So how do you map out like the best route to, and the times and all that other stuff? I mean... 
Well, like, like you I know, said, I, us, I have a loose idea of where I want to go okay. uh, each day. And then, uh, like I said, there's plan A and plan B. You know, if it's cloudy or rainy, we go go in the forest or shoot creeks or waterfalls, close-ups, that kind of thing. And if it's sunny or partly cloudy, then we're more out in the open and do kind of the bigger grand landscapes. Uh, so yeah, I kind of have a game plan and then go from the weather report. Now how many, how many places or how many points of interest can you do, well, I guess each day? Um, you know, I, I try to break it down into two sessions. We go out, you know, normally unless the weather is really inclement, um, we go out for a morning field shoot for a couple hours while the light's the best. And hopefully I have a primo spot at first to go to, and then a couple other secondary Backups. spots that are nearby within five minutes or 10 minutes. Okay. And then we can hit all those and have a really good morning. And, you know, sometimes something unexpected happens. So like with wildlife or birds, and then sometimes we might be out longer, you know, it's, it's, it just depends on the situation. Right. Uh, then we take a break and go over uh, what we shot in the morning, like in an afternoon review session, and then we go out in the evening for another field session, same yeah. thing. Okay, yeah. so basically two-ish locations a day uh, is reasonable. Reasonable, but we'll, we'll probably get more than that in, but you know, you got to make sure you have the main ones covered right, first. Right, yeah. right. What about if you're doing it on your own without a without uh, a uh, tour? You know, I, I don't know. I have do you a, do the same a, thing pretty much? Sort of, you know. I mean, I have an idea of what I visualize ahead of time. But to be honest, I'll, I'll go with an idea and when I get out there, I'll see something completely different. And to me, that's still the most fun mm -hmm. because I just discovered something with my eyes or my lenses that I would, most people would just walk by, you know, more like intimate landscapes or macro shots even, things like that. Like ice formations for me in the winter and uh, just patterns of things in the forest. Uh, just, yeah, it's, it's the real neat part about photography is uh, most people walk by things, you see them and try to capture them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why, you know, Joe who works here, he has a philosophy that he doesn't travel with anyone who's not a photographer yeah. <laughs> because they don't understand that you need to stop and take a picture of that dandelion in the crack of the sidewalk because it looks so cool, you know? <laughs> I can't, can't dispute that. It's, you know, you don't want somebody in a car looking at the watch, yeah. <laughs> rushing you. I think we can all, any photographer can safely say that. Oh, we're very annoying to people who are not It probably goes both ways, right? Well, they just don't if understand they don't, yeah, they, why we have Yeah, they're like, to... you're stopping again? Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, are there seasons where you can plan to go to avoid the largest crowds? Like here, come in the summer. <laughs> it's so beautiful here in the summer. I don't find it, uh, the places I go here to be crowded. Well, because Everglades National Park is so huge. Well, do you go to Shark Valley? That can get crowded. Uh, we're going there in a couple of days late in the day. She said it wasn't going to be as crowded. Mm -hmm. But, like, I leave from Homestead and go out at dawn, and I hardly see anybody. Because it's huge. Yeah, I see a couple other people, and usually they're just photographers. Yeah. And, uh, so I like that. Um, a lot of national parks, that's getting to be a huge issue. The crowds. The crowds. That's what I hear, like it's, Yellowstone, and I've never been there, but I hear it's crazy. Yellowstone is, yeah, I mean, I only go in the winter now because okay. it's less busy. Summers are a bit insane. Glaciers become that too. Um, really? We went from like a million and a half uh, visitors per year to like three and a half million now. Wow. And so it's in a short time period, like a, a two months. And so everything is condensed and there's only one road going through. It's, you know, you have to even get up at 
dawn to get a parking spot that's and not, even then that's it's how shark valley is this time of year yeah and it's not enjoyable i mean all the big national parks are going through the same issue yosemite you know i could name a few others as well but um yeah you're almost better i mean the one thing that gives you a, a little bit of advantage being a photographer is the masses really aren't up at five or six I in know. the morning. <laughs> so you can get in there and shoot stuff at that time of day. Uh, that's one way to get around the crowds. But not all, like Sharp but Valley it's doesn't even, open until But even, uh, it's hard to book hotels or campsites. Yeah, and they're expensive. Yeah, and uh, so I'm not sure what the answer is. I think, you know, since uh, Instagram and the social media has become more popular, everybody wants to go. And get people their travel. selfie and yeah and people, people are really now. traveling to national parks uh in droves i mean it's hard to blame you know you know yeah who doesn't want to go there right you know but uh i've been trying to go to lesser known parks okay that's been a good strategy and to be honest uh my favorite national park is Teddy Roosevelt National Park. Where's that? It's the Badlands of North Dakota. Oh. Not many people know about it. And it's a 30 mile road loop in the park. And often in the morning, we're the only people there. Okay. And even, you know, when it gets busy, it's not busy. <laughs> uh, and it's a quaint little town. And it's, it's an amazing park. They get big weather in the summer, like storms going through, uh, there's a lot of flowers, Badland formations are amazingly cool and okay. great light. And it's really, other than Yellowstone, probably the second best national park, I think, for wildlife in the lower 48. Wow. I mean, there's bison, there's uh, prairie dogs, there's wild, lots of wild horses, coyotes, horses. all the prairie animals. And, uh, you know, they're fairly habituated, so it's easy to get good photos of them. And I've been taking groups there, I don't know, probably for 15 years now. And everybody who goes loves it. When do you go? June. And when it greens, it gets green. Uh, I do it every two years. Every two years. Yeah. Every other year. Yep, every other year. And, that uh, sounds interesting. I like the wild horses. Yeah. They're... they're and like you know, like last year, we sat there and watched. There was a duel between two of uh, the stallions. One stole some of he stole some mares from the other one, and then one guy was on the hill winning at the other guy, and they charged each other. And we were like, Oh quick, my quick, quick. god, how exciting! And yeah, so to witness something like that, wow. and we've had uh, herds of bison cross the river and swim in front of us. Like the whole herd, like 300 oh strong. Oh my gosh. That's so, so, yeah, cool. it's a great place. And uh, mm. so, yeah, that, I, I think that's other, you know, Glacier. Are you going this year or next year? Next year. I might be available. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that really appeals to me. Yeah, if how you saw the boat. How cold is it in no, June? It's not, I don't it's, like to be it's cold. It's usually not cold. What does not cold mean to you? Uh, pro I don't know. It's By June, it's probably, it could be 100, actually. Oh, I can Or 90. I can handle that. Yeah, that's too hot for me, but I like that's it. a different story. <laughs> Tuscany, we do Tuscany because we do shoulder season, which is late fall or early spring for, you know, the big tourist areas. Right. And so that's when we go to Tuscany in October, and it's it's a little cold for me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the it's thing, not, the thing is be... with, the, like you were asking me earlier about the national parks, when to go, though, the, the bad thing is, well, as far as crowds go, I mean, you want to be there at the best time right? So for the best photo opportunities. So, like, that usually means wildflowers in summer. So the parks are going to be busy in the summer. Right. Uh, and then fall color is the other big draw. And, uh, you know, a lot of the national parks that have fall colors are getting very popular. That's true. Like, I quit going to New England. It's just too hard to find lodging, and it's crowded. So I've been going to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Ah. And, I'm, a, uh, I'm a Michigander. Are you? Yep. Okay. Well, are you a youper <laughs> no. or a troll? No, I'm from Detroit. <laughs> okay. Well, I grew up uh, near you. Did you where did you grow? Just south of Toledo. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we used to go to Detroit quite a bit. I know. We, people from Toledo didn't like it when we called them, oh, Toledo, that's like a suburb of Detroit. No. <laughs> they don't like that for some reason. It's not even the same state. <laughs> right. But it kind of is like a suburb of Detroit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, all right. So yeah, but now you're in Montana. Jeez, yeah, Montana. That seems like a crazy. The place best thing I ever did. Have you seen the Northern Lights? Uh, yep. I never knew uh, that they were in Montana until well, last year or so. Yeah, any of the northern states can get them. Just depends how strong the aurora is. I have a little app on my phone that tells me when it's going to be good. Okay. And so I've gotten them a couple times. I've sat out there a lot of nights as well, all night and nothing. Oh, <laughs> uh, more than I've gotten them. But when you when you do, I've gotten a couple of times that were just that was in awe. Wow. Yeah. Now, uh, do they not last very long? Like are they uh, like depends. a minute or twenty minutes? No, I mean no, they usually all night last or... longer. Sometimes hours actually. Just okay. depends, you know, how strong uh, the aurora is that evening. Chances of me seeing them are none. Uh, well, if you don't like warm, if you're, if you're fond of warm weather, probably not. Because I'm, I'm Iceland a, is a good place to go in winter. That's supposed winter. to be the best place. It's in yeah, Norway or Iceland or Alaska, any place far north. And we, uh, when I took my group to Iceland, we had them two or three nights in a row. And, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was, oh. yeah, it was, it was well worth it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just get back to the park because you were talking about getting there early, but like Shark Valley doesn't open till eight or nine. Yeah, Do well, they that, let that's you... an anomaly. Most parks. Oh, they open. You Most can of get them in okay. 24 seven, yeah. Okay, so it's not a big problem to get in early. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, are, are, when you're in the national parks, and this might be different for each park, I don't know, mm -hmm. but do you have to stay like on trails that they tell you or? Again, yeah, each park has their own rules. Rules, so you have to yeah. learn all the rules before right. you go. Right, um, yeah, there's certain trails that they don't want you They're on. off limits. Yes, and uh, like in Zion, they've even banned tripods. Completely? Uh, at least in photo tours, because oh. apparently, you know, they get they'd get way. big groups and they'd set up tripods and then everybody had to go around them. Not a great situation. So yeah. that's unfortunate. But, uh, uh, you know, in Glacier, there's a couple places you're not allowed to go. Uh, so, you know, you just have to read the regulations. And, and so for just a, you know, me off the street, if I go to Glacier National Park, which Maybe in June I'll go. <laughs> yeah. um, do they give you the regulations when you drive in, or no? How do you know uh, what they are? Well, they I give, mean, you know what they, they are. No, you're they getting give a permit. The, yeah, they, it's it's involved with the permit. But what if you're just an average Joe off the street? Oh no, that well, that there's that's there's different rules for regular people. <laughs> it's not fair. Well, you can. Uh, I mean, if you're just there on your own. You can go anywhere in the park and photograph. There's, I mean, if you're not doing commercial photography or you're just there to take pictures and enjoy them, uh, you can go anywhere. But I mean, you can go down the trails I've and they tell you of, not to trail? I've climbed a lot of peaks in the park without trails and taking pictures from there. So, yeah, you can shoot from anywhere. So when you say you can't go down certain trails, that's only if you're in a commercial. Yes, or leading a, a workshop tour. Okay. Right. And so most of the parks, you can just go anywhere you, as on an your individual. Own, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. All right. I mean, they, they'll tell you if there's a restricted area, but right, it'll generally, have a sign or yeah, something. Or... Yeah, like we have a place. Uh, there's an alpine meadow area at uh, Logan Pass in our park and uh, they don't want people out there trampling around in the flowers oh, right. so yeah. you know that that's kind of off limits so there are places in parks that are you know you have to kind of you know they generally let you know there'll be a sign somewhere yeah, yeah. okay yeah. How much gear do you take with you, and does it depend on where you're going? Less gear, the older I get. Ah, you're like me. <laughs> like yeah, a, I used to carry I, the full uh, low backpack, 
filled to the gills. But uh, I got smarter as I got older, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a real techie gear head, so I really make do with minimal equipment. I have two camera bodies, two wide-angle lenses, a telephoto lens, and maybe a flash. And, you know, spare batteries and blah, blah, blah. No flash in Everglades National Park, by the way. No flash? That's one of their rules. Oh, well... I don't see why we'd ever need it. Well, sometimes <laughs> you know. for bird photography, you get a better oh, beamer. And yeah. Shh. I've seen people. I, I don't do that. But you can't but, do it uh, in Everglades National Park, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Speaking well, of limit yeah. rules and regulations, I know that one because yeah. that's our permit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it, obviously, if I drive somewhere, I'll have more equipment. But if I'm flying, you know, you're, you're kind of restricted. And it's nice. I have a smaller bag. Now that I can carry, uh, when I do street photography, like you know, like I was in Prague last year and uh, did a lot of city stuff, it's just nice to be a little more mobile and, and inconspicuous as well, right, you know, and, right. uh, in those situations. So for landscape photography, I'm one of your regular landscape outings mm -hmm. you're gonna have two wide lenses and a telephoto that's those are your lenses pretty much and what know. how wide and how how tall um so i'm a canon <laughs> canon guy okay um i have an 11 to 24 really wide uh 24 to 70 or 105 and that's my workhorse lens that i use the most and is that what I, you use for street photography, 24 to 105? Most of the time. Sometimes the 11. It just depends where... Well, Prague is so dang crowded. Well, again, you go out at dawn, it's not so bad. You know, I went out... I've only been there once. I went there this summer. And we hired somebody. You know, I always hire a guide. I always hire a photography guide because how do I know where to go, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, you can do all that research... Or you can just hire a guide. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like how many? I probably I don't know if I'll ever go back there. But anyway, she picked us up at 4:30, I think, in the morning. Mm -hmm. But it was a Sunday morning, and it was there were probably a hundred people on the Charles Bridge because they were uh, still there. Yeah, well, from Saturday night. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that, yeah, that can happen. I mean, it wasn't crowded, but it was. You know, there were, but there were you know, at least 100 people on that bridge. There were a lot of Chinese people getting wedding photos oh, yeah, on the river this this uh, fall. They and were, another town. We they were there in the, the summer, Czech too. Republic. Yeah, I mean, there was and they're in Tuscany, light Oliver. setups like you have here and uh, the whole works. And, yeah, I was, like, astounded. I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, I did because I went to Paris yeah. in 2010, and they were all over in Paris. Tuscany, every iconic place we go in Tuscany, if you're there too early, well, sunset mm -hmm. time, they're all there. <laughs> There's a lot of Chinese people in the world, you know, so they travel. Yeah. <laughs> and they travel with their photographers. They do. They, they, like, they like their photography. Um, yeah, but I, like, I shot in Prague at blue hour, you know, like half hour before sunrise and uh, sun you didn't see too many people there wasn't yeah i, I gotta have, remember I no, sun any, yeah, no sunday mornings <laughs> yeah i didn't have any well i mean i, I did more streets and let, i didn't do charles bridge there was just too many people on it but there were so many other things to photograph Co the cobblestone streets had been rained on and so they were highly reflective of the lighting and that place uh, is gorgeous i love it there yeah um, so back to the landscape stuff. What um, oh, what was the long lens that you bring? I use the uh, Canon one to four hundred. Okay, uh, which, 100 to uh, yeah, and I have a one four tele you know converter, so, so you it goes up to five hundred sixty. Is that what you have for this birding? Tool it is. Too? Yeah, okay. I don't have. I had a six hundred f four big lens for a couple years, and it was nice to have. But it's just, I found it was just, I didn't use it enough, and it was just too hard to lug around. And, you know, to fly with it, it's, it you almost have to have, bring another person I to know. have the carry on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm just back to that. You know, and I don't, I'm not a wildlife bird photographer as a stock photographer. I get some good shots, but it's not my main thing. Mm -hmm. So, you You're know. You're more into landscapes, I right? don't, Yeah. 
And I, I mainly use the longer lens, you know, for well, for birds and wildlife, but I use it for sports as well. Now, do you have a favorite, like, backpack company or way to carry your gear? Or? Uh, you know, I, I guess I've used low backpacks low. for quite a while. Low Pro? Low Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have so many bags, you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep trying to get rid of them, but then it's like, but I used that that one time, and I used that one that one time, <laughs> and I used that one. Well, I might need that big backpack, even though I have a small backpack that I like better. Mm-hmm. But I don't really even use that very often, but I use it when I go to Tuscany, so I gotta keep that one, you know. And I don't seem to have a favorite brand at all. I'm all over the place. Is there anything else that you should bring, like on a, if you're gonna go on a photo tour well, to a national park? Well, I mean, the, 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 the tripod is, seems to be the, the big issue. When a lot of photographers start out, you know, they're on a budget, so they really skimp on the, uh, the tripods and they're very shaky and unstable, the cheap ones and I often will walk by and flick it with my finger and it's going like this and I'm like, no. that's not gonna work. I go, you know, you, you invest some money in a good tripod if you wanna keep doing this. How do you get some? I should get kickbacks, all the tripods and tripod heads I've sold over the years. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I mean, that's one investment that will last you probably your entire career of photography. And it's probably the most important if you're doing long exposures. You have to have it. There's just no two ways about it. I wish I could figure out how to teach, like, how to get people to really hear that. Because probably everyone on my show says that. Mm -hmm. And yet, when we went to Tuscany, thank God, <coughs> I did a joint with with Stefano because <clears throat> excuse me he had a friend bring two tripods because one lady brought a brand new one but it was you know a hundred dollar tripod and it literally fell apart when we were trying to put it up it just started I told falling a lady apart. to bring one once on a private tour and she brought a selfie stick she didn't know oh wow <laughs> yeah and the other one ladies was so cheap it wasn't worth but you can get you don't even have to invest you don't have to get a carbon fiber you can get a nice uh alloy uh, tripod legs and head probably for like three to five hundred bucks and like i said it'll last forever and you know it's just everything matters as far as sharpness I mean, I think we're kind of getting away from that because so many people use the phones now. And, you know, you only see it this big on a screen. Small pixel, you know, you what, know, 72 uh, pixels? You know, yeah, but if you want to make your work stand out and have it in bigger displays as, a, you know, a nice print on the wall, for example, you know, sharpness matters. So yeah. every little detail you can do to enhance that is, uh, ma you know, magnified the bigger you go. I mean, I make huge prints, like eight feet sometimes at client's order. And if it doesn't hold up, it's, you know, you'd, you gotta have something that's gonna go that big. So I have, you know, I have a 50 megapixel camera and then I do all the sharpness. Uh, I use a cable release, I use the mirror lockup the tripod, sturdy tripod, so it's as sharp as it possibly can be. All right, just go through that again for our audience. You want the sharpest you can be, you gotta have a good tripod. Good tripod, uh, cable release, because believe it or not, just pushing your finger down on the uh, camera can cause a slight vibration. Also, you have a, uh, the mirrorless cameras, obviously, don't pay attention to that. <laughs> but the, uh, most SLRs still have a mirror, so if it's, it slaps up during the taking of the photo and a long exposure that can cause a slight vibration and softness in a picture so as well so you flip the mirror up before the the uh, shutter opens so that eliminates that and that's a that's in the menu it is uh, uh, most of the higher end will all have mirror lock up okay yeah all right so th yeah those are the three most important things. Now, do you do a lot of, teach a lot of long exposure photography on your workshops? We do, I mean, cause we're out, you know, at dusk or dawn and sometimes it's multiple seconds or on a really overcast day, you're in the forest, it could be even raining, you know, you could be up to like a five, 10 second exposure with the water moving, which 
you know, it gives it a cool silky look. Um, and then we do some nighttime stuff as well with the stars. And those are usually 20 to 30 second exposures. If now, you hand hold that, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, do you recommend filters? We, we just had like two shows in a row, I think, about filters. But, um, uh, I'm not much into the filters anymore. Um, you know, I, when I was a film photographer, I had a whole array of filters because you needed them. Now, um, I use post-processing, like I'll blend uh, a darker image with a lighter image, so I don't need the split neutral density filter anymore. The only filter that I use is a polarizing filter, and that's to cut the glare out of like the water in a creek or a waterfall or a lake or something. That's about it. And do you use that polarizer all day long? Uh, just when it, it's needed. Um, most of the time not because my theory is you know you have a say a thousand dollar lens nice piece of glass why do you want to put a ten dollar piece of <laughs> you know like a lot of people put UV filters to protect their lens I just buy camera insurance or lens insurance uh, if I dropped it but you know uh, yeah why do you why do you want to put a piece of ten dollar plastic in front of your nice glass you know what I do? I leave my lens hood on all the time. That's a good... And good, that's really has saved me because especially, you know, you know I do a mm -hmm. lot of event photography, so mm -hmm. I've got two cameras hanging off me half the time, mm -hmm. and I'm banging into stuff, you know, so that lens hood lens <laughs> are, and, saves and my lens. And they're good for lens flare, too. So Yeah, well, yeah. and sometimes you need that, you right? Exactly. Sometimes, Although lens flare is in fashion now, you know. <laughs> I, I despise it. I... If I get any, I, I try to remove it. <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, you probably started photography maybe even before I did, and we were just taught that is so bad. Yeah. And then when people started doing it on purpose, it was like, oh, my gosh, it was like fingernails on the chalkboard to me. But then I kind of grew to like it. It's yeah. kind of cool sometimes. Mm -hmm. now, I, now I like it. I've, I've taught a lot of people how to do the sun star thing where you, you know, diffract the sun or on like a tree limb or something in your composition and get the points of the star or the, the sun in your shot and that's quite a neat effect. Well go ahead and talk, tell, you can't, you can't <laughs> say that without teaching our well, audience. Say you're, you know, say you're looking into the sun and you have some like a tree and wildflowers below and they're all nice and backlit. Uh, yeah, a neat effect is to put a sun star so you have to keep moving the tripod minutely or just to get the sun peeking around like the corner of the tree or a tree limb. And then you stop your lens down to like F16 and it'll create this star in the shot. And you, you have to keep moving because the sun's moving all the time. But it's a really neat effect and uh, people really like it. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to expose when you're doing that, though, right? Because your, um, me your meter. You don't, well, you, you you take your meter reading. Yeah, I should explain that. You take your meter reading off to the side, and you know check it first. Uh, say your flower. You want your flowers, backlit flowers, to look a certain way. Take a shot of that first, then recompose it, and you don't pay attention to the bright sun, like yeah, because it'll mess up the exposure. Meter. Yeah. So it's always good to uh, take a meter reading off something neutral, lock it in. I shoot manually quite often, and so I will get my exposure first and then recompose a shot often. So I'm just going to recap that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to meter on like a mid-tone somewhere mid -tone, where the sun's yeah. not blasting at you. Right. But the mid-tone's going to be the same mm -hmm. the same tone as your flowers or whatever yeah. whatever your main subject yeah. is take yeah and then take so a you're going to meet her without the sun in the picture right. first right. maybe you even use your lens hood <laughs> uh -huh. maybe. Or, a, or your hand could be your mm -hmm. and then then as soon as you get the sun in the shot it's going to be all wacky but you're the we well, the meter, the in meter. Man, yeah if you're shooting in manual then you're fine yeah if you're shooting in aperture shutter priority and you just point it at the sun, chances are it's going to be vastly underexposed. Yeah, I didn't, you know what, I always... It's another good reason to shoot in manual. I try to teach my students in my workshops to shoot in manual because they learn how things work, you know, like what 
shutter speed does versus aperture. And once you learn to understand the basics of how they work together, then you can create photos instead of just taking them. So say I had a guy ride by a cowboy in a pasture. He had a rain slicker on, yellow, all the cowboy look, and I wanted him riding fast with a blurry background. So I'm like, okay, I, I need a, yeah, I need a pan and shot. So I need a slow shutter speed. So I'm gonna be a 30th of a second and I'm gonna pan with them. And so I'm creating when I'm using the shutter speed or aperture to create different effects in the photo. I took 200 photos, two of them turned out sharp. Panning is <laughs> but hard. But it didn't matter. I got the one, uh, as long as you get one at the end of the day, I mean, I was, I was tickled. We always try to teach panning in Cuba with those cool cars, mm -hmm. you know? But it's funny, Heather and I were just looking at each other because like I'm a fanatic about teaching people to shoot in manual. Mm -hmm. I mean, I forget that there is any other mode, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because, but I, I don't know why all these photography instructors, oh, just put an aperture priority. Uh, yeah. And then they don't really fully understand what's happening. The only time, and you can't get that sun star. I mean, you right. might get it if you're lucky. Right. But chances are you're not going to get a nice, you know, I call it the starburst effect. You're calling it something else. But you can't, you can't, like for me, uh, you know, people here, they want to do sunset portraits, let's say. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that. You cannot no. do it if you're not shooting in manual. No. You're either going to expose for the people or the sky, one or the other, if you're shooting in any automatic mode. Right. You have to learn to shoot in manual. So yeah. thank you for, I like you, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only time I put it in uh, like aperture priority is, um, and actually I'm using ISO priority now. Um, I set my shutter speed and my aperture and put it in auto ISO. And when I'm just driving around with my big lens beside me and, you know, there's some wildlife. I have, I'm shooting out of the car, for example. I roll the window down and I can bang and get the shot because they don't wait around for you. They don't wait for you? No, so <laughs> you can't be messing with the settings. And so that, that, that's where, uh, you know, like an automated uh, uh, aperture or whatever works well. But the rest of the time... Manual is a good way to go. Yeah, yeah. and I, I do just the same as you do. If I'm in a, one of those, like, uh, well, a Cuba trip, even though I don't think we're going to do Cuba trips anymore, but when we do that trip, we shoot in the middle of the day in the town. And mm -hmm. you know how the lighting is. It's, it's like really harsh on one side of the street, and there's this big shadow, and, you know, you <laughs> flip that way, you flip this way, you've got totally different exposures, and that's when I say use auto ISO. But still control your shutter and mm -hmm. your aperture. But that's, you know, the ISO, you, if you're going to do that starburst effect or the sunset portrait, you got to put that ISO back onto well, that, regular. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, so like for landscape photography, aperture usually is the most important aspect. You know, you want everything wide angle shot. You want the flowers in the foreground, the mountains in the background, all in focus. Shutter speed doesn't really mean as much. But for anything that's moving, then shutter speed becomes the more important aspect. Right. So you set that and then, you know, set your aperture and your ISO to make it work. Right. Yeah. All right. So any last uh, little lessons you want to give us or any, anything about what Well, about? I mean, I think it is a, like to, to become a better photographer, you really have to learn to see light. I mean, it's easily probably easier said than done, but I mean, just experience will teach you a lot. But, you know, I see people all the time with their cell phones, mostly making these huge mistakes. You know, they want to line everybody up and get a picture with somebody like there'll be a super bright background and they're in the shade. <laughs> I'm like, that's not going to turn out. I, want, I just want to go up and tell them all the time. So you really have to learn to make the light work for you. Like, like I was saying, cloudy days can be awesome. Uh, you can do details. Portraits are much better, much more pleasing. You don't have the harsh light. Um, so, yeah, learning to, to, to use the light to your advantage is probably the biggest thing. I you know think. what? I, and I agree. The beginning of my lighting class, 
it's just I'm just showing them pictures saying where's the light coming from you got to remember where's the light coming from where's the light and you wouldn't believe how hard that is for people they don't they don't even well, when they're looking at a picture they're still not seeing where the light comes from but they after like the fourth picture they start they start recognizing what they're looking for and they start you know oh, the I other thing it, you is know? like our human eyes are amazing we can see details like you know I can look into this bright reflector and I, at the same time I can see in the corner all the detail in the shadow your little machine your little camera box can't do that no and you also have to learn to realize what you see is not going to translate always into your camera you have to understand the limitations of the camera I mean that's why a lot of guys are doing the multiple exposures and blending them now to get more dynamic range uh, so you're just always working on overcoming the obstacles that your technology or equipment still isn't nearly what your eye is right so I think that's an important uh, thing to understand as well now, now, tell me about what, what workshops do you have coming up for the rest of the year? Well, I've got a, yeah, I've got a nice, fun uh, array of them. Uh, I, uh, on the other east side of the Rocky Mountains from where I live is the transition zone between prairie and mountains, and it's quite abrupt. It's all saved as quasi-wilderness and it's a really stunning place in the spring uh, in may i'll be taking a group there with the wildflowers and in the mornings the light the peaks light up behind it and there's nobody there mm. and i've got uh some i got a That's, ranch when is that in the uh, third week of may okay uh the time with you know when the flowers hopefully are the best and then i've got a cowboy or a ranch that we'll go to and shoot some action yeah. photos with cowboys with a great background uh, then I do Glacier National Park. I do that in the summer, and we also go to a Native American powwow one evening. They have a rodeo and dancing, and that's very photogenic. And most people have not been to one, and they Never really, <laughs> they really enjoy that. Uh, and then in the fall, I've got um, a Canadian Rockies, and then. Where else am I going? Maine in the summer for puffin birds. Oh, yeah. I've taken a group there. And then uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I end the year in Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, we went this year to scout it out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I have to go back. <laughs> went I, to Kauai. I've which never was, been there, but it's so beautiful. The yeah, pictures. Kauai. I don't know. I haven't been to the other islands, but Kauai was stunning. That's yeah. so exciting. Yeah, so a little bit of everything. Wow. And yeah. what's your website? Uh, it's my name, Chuck Haney, all one word, dot com. Chuck Haney dot com. Yep. Okay. And I have a newsletter that I put out about every six weeks. You can sign up on the, on website? the, web, on the website for that. I have a Facebook and Instagram page, though I'm not a you know big social media guy. Uh, not my thing so much but I, I i post on there when i do new stuff and uh so yeah uh, the website also has um uh, like a portfolios uh site that you can go to and my pictures are quite big and there's folders of all these different areas and oh so we can yeah, check yeah, out you can a lot see of your the work best, best of the best work chuckhaney.com chuckhaney.com awesome yeah. Thank you for being on the Understand Photography Show. Yeah, I'm so tickled you invited me, and uh, it's great to come down to Florida and I get some warm here. weather, see some birds, and uh, and share the joy of photography with uh, you and with my group coming up. And awesome. So I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah. And thank you to our audience for watching the Understand Photography Show. Remember, we broadcast on Fridays at 4 p.m. If you do us a big favor and leave us a, a review on iTunes, that helps us so much you wouldn't believe it. I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next Friday. Get up!